trying to make a movie about it. Trying to make a movie. Um, I've gotten Mad Magazine either through subscription or the newsstand since the Saturday Night Fever edition. Um, and I Okay, call every studio in town. <laughs> one, of the, one of the great ironies is that Bill eventually, in his dotage, sold Mad Magazine to Time Warner. So Time Warner, this voracious corporate pig, goes, and in fact, what happened as soon as he sold Mad Magazine? In the whole 35 years of Mad Magazine, exactly, there was not one ad. Now there's advertising. But it's still very funny. They still have funny stuff. Sure, there's great artists. But you know what they did to piss me off? What? I love those Mad Magazine parodies of the movies. Yeah. You know? They don't do them very often. And, well, they uh, came out with a book like three years ago, a big book, Mad Magazine movie parodies. I went, great! And I went and bought it. And I'm looking through it and I'm thinking, where's West Side Story? And where I'm looking through it. You know what it was? They only put in Warner Brothers movies. <laughs> oh. I thought, those fuckers. But that's. <laughs> No, I agree with you. We agree, but we're not, we don't write checks. When you say George Clooney, I mean, he's actually the person to be involved George, uh, well, he also wants $25 million, so. You can get $25 million. No, you, have, you don't understand how this works in the real world. Right? Okay, agents who are gatekeepers don't want their clients making small movies. They want their clients making big, big studio pictures. They want John Cusack not to make a little good movie like he used to make. They, wa they want him to make 2012, or what's it called? 10? 2012. 2012, because he can get big bucks, of which they get money. It's complicated. And do and you know, whoa, 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 did you know that if you go to an actor, say, I would like Brad Pitt to read this. Well, first of all, you never get to Brad. But his gatekeepers, his people, they go, well, why shouldn't we read this? Okay, tell you what, we'll read this if you put $10 million in the bank in escrow. We'll read it. Because they say, listen, if you're using his name to make the movie, to raise the money, well, then Brad's the producer, isn't he? And suddenly it's 50% and $25 million. It's, it's a whole craziness out there. It depends on the career they're going because Travolta said Pulp Fiction for less than the guy that's career. The Travolta was down and out at that point. <laughs> Yeah, but unfortunately, he's doing well, so. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, well, that's it. When I was at, uh, at Universal in L.A., I had a really nice office at Universal in L.A. for like 23 years. You know why I left? They tore my building down to build Jurassic Park the ride. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I'm out of here. But anyway, um, I used to make a lot of movies for everybody out of that office. I, you know, I was just there by the grace of Lou Wasson. In fact, I became a television company because when they sold it to the Japanese, some accountant in Osaka went, why are we paying for this guy's overhead? And they came to me and said, what, what are you doing here? I'm doing television. Really? Yeah. So, did you, you're too young. Remember Dream On on HBO? So I made that show for seven years. And then, uh, what else? We did Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and, and Sliders and we did a lot of shows. But, uh, Weird Science, we did a lot of shows. Anyway, that was just like, hate my fucking building. Um, anyway, it's, it's tough out there. It's a difficult atmosphere. The good news is, the new technology allows anyone to make a movie and go see Paranormal. It's really scary, I went and saw it, it's great. And it was made for like $60,000. So, uh, with uh, being such an iconic uh, individual in uh, FX, uh, you know, American Werewolf, what's your, how do you feel like construction makeup, latex, silicone, you know? No, those, versus these, are, these are ridiculous arguments. These, no, all of these things are just tools, just tools. I like all of it when it's good, and I don't like it when it's bad. It's that simple. But there's this weird argument against, well, it's not CG. It's CG. It's not the old fact. The truth is, you use what works. And uh, it's, it, there's a whole other argument about the ignorance of the executives now. 
These movies are caught, like The Wolfman's going to be close to $200 million. I mean, it's like, hello, what the fuck? That's the sheer incompetence. But the, uh, and I'm hoping they don't screw up Rick's work. Rick Baker did great work. I saw it, and I think they're putting a lot of CG over it. Because that's what people pay to go see. And, uh, however, the truth is, some G CG is great, some of it's not. That you need, ultimately, like Guillermo del Toro very successfully, have you seen that in the, uh, what are they called? Hellboy movies. You know that Aquaman guy? Well, he's a guy in a suit, but a lot of the stuff on his face is CG. So it's a combination, and you get the best of both. Uh, in Pirates of the Caribbean, which I, all those movies I just thought were ridiculous, but <laughs> I love the CG on the cat, what's his name? Bill Davy Bill Jones, Bill Nye. Bill Nye. Do you know he just wore a blue mask? Yeah. That, that's all, that, that's nothing, there's nothing, that, it's fantastic looking. So, it depends. Yeah, it depends if you get a budget for like Disney. It also depends if you know what you're doing. Yeah. It's, when anything's new, Every, do you, well, I don't know, are you guys movie buffs? Yeah. All right, do you remember in the early 60s, from about 1961 to about 75, everybody was Zoom crazy. It was Zooming all the fucking time, especially the Italians, but everybody was Zoom, Zoom. Well, hey, look at the Wild Bunch. It's just all Zoom, Zoom. Do you know why? What was invented in 1961? The Zoom lens. And when Steadicam came, um, I was in pre-production on American Werewolf. I was in Twickenham Studios. And Dick Lester and uh, Richard Attenborough have had offices there. It's a long time ago. <laughs> and um, Dickie Attenborough said, uh, John, you want to meet Stanley Kubrick? I went, yes, please. <laughs> he says, well, he's looking at a new piece of equipment at Boreham Wood before they tore down in Jim Boreham Wood, which is now apartments. But so we go there, and there's this guy, Gareth Brown, and he's got this amazing thing, a steady cam. And he shows his demonstration. And Kubrick obviously used it about six years later on The Shining brilliantly. But it was an amazing piece of equipment. And I said to Garrett, listen, uh, how long are you in London? He said, I'm leaving tomorrow. Can I rent this? <laughs> and in America, Barry Wolf London's the second movie to ever use a steady cam. First movie was called Bound for Glory. Good movie. Have you seen that? Hal Ashby? No, Bound for Glory is um, Hal Ashby. It stars David Carradine about Woody Guthrie. It's got some amazing shots that are steady cam. And uh, I used it, and then Marty Scorsese used it brilliantly in Goodfellas. Remember that shot from the kitchen? Um, and then Brian De Palma went crazy and ruined it for everybody. But <laughs> the thing is, is that the steady cam, it was such an interesting piece of equipment, and I used it. I only had it four days, and I used it in the tubes. It's the werewolf's POV, and I used it in a nightmare sequence. And I was at Technicolor London with Bob Painter, my DP, and we're looking at dailies, and he, I'll never forget, he said, hey, there's an instant cliche. Because it was so obvious we're going to see this shot again, you know. <laughs> but you don't see Steadicam as much now, or it's used better, so you're unaware of it. Jim Cameron, who's a smart guy, did you ever see Aliens? You know what he did in Aliens? It was so smart. He said, let's take steady cam rigs and put machine guns on them. <laughs> Didn't they look great? Yeah. Those were just steady cam rigs. <laughs> anyway, what? Ask me something else. <laughs> you right there. Mr. Warp's a documentary I made about a, two years ago on Don Rickles that was shown on HBO. Did anyone see it? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I want an Emmy. Come on. You can, uh, you can get it on um, Amazon. I'm very proud of it. It's a feature. Um, and you know who's in it? Clint Eastwood, Chris Rock, Bobby De Niro, everybody. Yeah. Who's in it? Everybody. Sarah Silverman, <laughs> Sidney Poitier. I got everybody in that movie. Um, <laughs> In the movie, <laughs> the reason I made it, if you remember, when I was 18, I worked on a picture called Kelly's Heroes in Yugoslavia. Hey, I was just a schlepper, okay? I was a gopher. And uh, I, that's where I met Don Rickles. So I've known him since 1969, and he's worked for me in three movies. You ever see Innocent Blood? He's really funny. Yeah. Anyway, um, 
And I went to Don's 70th birthday, his 75th birthday, and his 80th birthday. We had these big parties. And at his 80th birthday, I looked around, and so many people were not there who were at the last party. And so many people who were there, I realized, gee, my kids don't even know who these people are. And I thought that Don was not getting the attention he should, or the respect. 